the 2020 COSEP National Conference. Today, we will hear from our third keynote speaker, Professor Murat Yusel. Professor Yusel is a clinical neuropsychologist based at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Murat is a world leading expert in addiction and mental health. He is an NHMRC Principal Research Fellow at the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health at Monash and the Director of Brain Park, a unique public facing research clinic designed to bring the latest neuroscience to the community in an accessible and inspiring way. Over two decades, Murat has worked in the interface between clinical psychology, psychiatry, neuroscience, and technology. His group adopts a transdiagnostic approach to investigate whether the onset and trajectories of substance abuse, behavioral addictions, and obsessive compulsive disorder are underpinned by common or overlapping neurocognitive factors. Murat and his Brain Park team are pioneers in combining neuroscience, lifestyle medicine, and digital technology to make assessments fun and interventions widely accessible. Their interventions range from physical exercise, yoga, and meditation, to virtual reality, cognitive training, and brain stimulation to create accessible treatments that can be engaging, effective, and self-administered. Murad is one of the world's most highly cited addiction researchers. His work has had an exceptional and enduring impact on the world stage, staying in the top 1% of the world's most influential scientific work for over 10 years. Today, Murad will speak about Brain Park and other broader capabilities of the Turner Institute at Monash about the Delphi method of building expert consensus to accelerate new research and his experience in applying this method to the addiction space and now to the so uh, cognitive fitness framework, utilizing an incredible collective brain power of international expert panels. I've always found Murat's work fascinating, thought-provoking and professionally challenging. I have no doubt today's presentation will be an eye-opener for many. It will certainly offer many insights into where our profession is heading into the future. Can you please join me in welcoming Professor Murat Yusuf? Thank you. I, um, I'm a professor at the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health and also the director of Brain Park, which you'll hear a lot about in a second. Uh, my training is in clinical neuropsychology and uh, I have a PhD in the area of mental health. I've been working in it for about 20 years. I uh, started off the first 10 years mainly trying to understand the foundational mechanisms by which addictions and compulsions, um, what drives addictions and compulsions at the level of brain and cognition. And then over the last five to 10 years, switched to more trying to develop novel assessments and interventions that will help um, advance the field and also help people struggling with addictions, compulsions and more broadly mental health. Um, I have a disclosure to make, which is that I am a passionate Tiger supporter. It's been a good year and um, it's been a few good years actually, so I'm pretty happy about that. I have a few other more boring disclosures to make which is that I get funding from my university as well as the government philanthropy and also some private firms in relation to some of my clinical work. But none of this has any influence over the design, management, analysis, presentation or publications of what I do. Okay, so into the talk. It, I want to start by just thinking about this young man and he, he's he been struggling with gambling and he has been spending more money than he would like on gambling really over the over months. It started off as something that was fun, but now he's finding that he's, you know, he's spending money he can't afford. He's struggling to control his behaviour. Uh, he finds lots of cues and triggers in the environment that keeps him going back to gambling. He stopped much of his social activities as well as his structured community activities like participating in sport and so on. He's quite worried and he wants some help. 
Now, some options for him are things like Gamblers Anonymous or uh, other options like group therapy or a GP or psychiatrist or other specialist. But in reality, we know that 90% of people in this young man's shoes are not going to engage with the current forms of help. They just don't. So is there anything else that we could provide that potentially is more engaging and will help attract some sort of uh, invitation to engage in the solution for someone like this young man? Well, possibly could could lifestyle interventions facilitated by technology uh, be a potential solution? For example, is it possible that one day we could give this young man a tablet and say, here, play some games. And as he's playing games, we're indexing his psychological style, some really key components that we think are important in his psychological profile that might be linked to gambling. So as he's playing these games, we're indexing these. And then we're getting him into a specific exercise program that is making his brain a bit more plastic, open to new learning, open to breaking old habits and learning new habits. We also give him some sessions where we put a virtual reality monitor on him or a head mounted display. And we put him in gambling scenarios, these high risk situations where he's interacting with the environment like he would be in a casino. And we're seeing what triggers him, his body, his mind, what are the triggers that are in there that link to these uh, profiles? We can measure that dynamically. And then we give him other skills like mindfulness practices, just to distance himself from those triggers and urges and to be able to resist them and, um, and grow uh, uh, some strength against the, the cravings and gain extra self-control. Is that possible? I think it is because one of the biggest things we've learned in the last 20 years is the brain really does change as a result of experience. So if you have experiences that are regular and intense, that will change the brain. Just like in the case of this young man, it's gambling has changed the brain. These other activities that we can provide him with uh, can change the brain for good as well, rather than for, for bad habits, for good habits. I think we can achieve this and I'd like to propose some of the work that we're doing that is heading down this path. If we start with the idea that the brain is very plastic and there's a lot of things that we can do to change our brain, this is one example where here we're looking at the volume of the hippocampus, a part of the brain in the temporal lobes, very much involved in things like stress regulation, emotion regulation, memory, learning. Uh, and you can see that across our lifetimes, we tend to stay pretty flat in terms of volume. And then somewhere in the 50s, we decline in terms of brain volume. And the reason the hippocampus is really interesting is because it's actually a part of the region that's part of the brain that's really sensitive to what's going on in the environment, what's going on with you and your experiences. It reacts to what's going on in your life. And it's like a proxy for um, general brain change and brain health. So if we look at this trajectory and then we look at there's some blues and there's some orange lines. The blue lines represent individuals that over almost a decade when they've been remeasured have gone up in volume and the orange lines are decreases in volume. And we can see that for the, the large proportion of 20s to 50s, most people are increasing in volume, a few decreasing, and then after sort of from 60s onwards, most people are decreasing, but there's actually a lot of people that are still increasing well into their 70s and maybe even 80s. And the other thing you notice is this huge variation, individual variation across the lifespan. So you could be, you know, here or here, on that trajectory or that trajectory, there's a lot of variation and that makes it really interesting. So we did a study a few years ago with Lauren where we got people in their 50s who were essentially not very active in office jobs and we got them into a 12 week high intensity uh, exercise program. And at the beginning and end of those 12 weeks, we measured their fitness, their hippocampal volume, other things to do with their brain and their cognition. And what we found after the 12 weeks was that their physical fitness increased by 15% as indexed by the VO2 max, which is a gold standard index of their fitness. Um, but 
aside from the physical improvements, we, sh we showed brain and cognitive improvements. The hippocampus actually increased by 3%. Remember, these people are in this band. So there's quite a mix of you know, ups and downs, but consistently for people who did 12 weeks of exercise, we saw an increase in their hippocampus by 3%. That was also um, complemented by changes in the neural integrity of the hippocampus. <clears throat> that is, you have some chemicals that are floating around in your brain, and some of them, uh, such as N-acetylaspartate, N-A, uh, N-acetylaspartate, which is something that the more you have of, the more healthy your cells tend to be. That increased by 16% in that region of the hippocampus after 12 weeks, and your verbal memory uh, improved by 6%. So all of that in just the space of three months. So it shows that even with a 12-week, three-month exercise intervention, you can actually change this trajectory, uh, not only anatomically, but functionally as well. And later on, what <coughs> another student, Josh, found was that it's not just the level of physical activity that determines the hippocampal volume and functional properties. It's actually your baseline fitness as well. So even if you're not exercising, but you have a good baseline fitness, these things tend to be better. So the physical fitness has significant uh, neural and cognitive implications. So based on these results and a set of earlier results that we, we did this study, and we've done a series of studies in long-term heavy cannabis users where we find that this trajectory uh, tends to be accelerated. So it's people who have been using for five to 10 years, it's almost like they're aging much more rapidly, particularly in the hippocampus. They're losing eight to 10% more volume than their comparable peers of similar age and background. So we're currently running an NHMRC study where we've got daily users engaged in high intensity interval training, like in this study, and they're going for 12 weeks. And what we've got so far, we don't have the results, we're halfway through it and we've had to stop because of COVID, but up until that point, we had an 84% compliance rate with our three times a week regime. So almost every time these daily cannabis users were turning up for their exercise regime, and 94% of them are completing 12 weeks of exercise, which is unheard of in terms of any kind of intervention that you would do in this group. Normally, there'd be a lot of non-adherence, dropouts, and so on. So either we're doing something right in terms of the approach of lifestyle medicine, being physical activity, being very acceptable to these people, or that in combination with the way that we're doing it at Brain Park through various supports and personalization um, and the general approach is working, but it's, it's all the signs are good. We don't have the results yet in terms of this, but uh, we look forward to getting them next year. So we've published a lot of this work. If anyone's interested in following any of them up, they can using these references. But besides our work in the brain, <coughs> other work of colleagues such as Firth and Rosenbaum uh, have shown that unequivocally in the context of depression, physical activity is just as efficacious as medication and psychotherapies. So that's pretty powerful. That something as low cost and accessible as and with so few side effects of exercise can be so powerful. And not only that, but it's even more powerful in those with a history of mental illness. And it works across age, gender, ethnicity, SES. So very, very transportable and effective across many populations and it's not just that we see similar results with colleagues across nutrition such as the work of Felice Jacker and Adrian O'Neill in the SMILES trial where they've shown similar results to this in depression and anxiety and at very low cost you can achieve these cognitive brain and mental health benefits similarly in mindfulness with the work of Craig Hassett and Richard Chambers and with sleep with the work of Shantha Rajaratnam and Josh Wiley, we see lots of good pro-brain health effects, pro-cognitive health effects, and pro-mental health effects. However, a lot of these studies are still young. A lot of this uh, evidence is emerging in the last five or so years, 
and the individual studies that have been run to date tend to be small, they don't have very good control conditions, they tend to be in small samples with particular sorts of demographics like just the elderly and uh, they also rely a lot on memory recall of how much you exercised. Um, so we need to create higher quality studies and run, run them uh, clinical trials that can offer more assertive um, solutions and give us a better understanding of what components are actually working and which ones aren't so that we can better tailor these to people. So coming back here, if all of these are showing these pro-brain cognitive and mental health effects, then we can choose one or some combination of these to really change the position we're in on this trajectory and the actual trajectory we're on within this trajectory. So we can get someone who is maybe uh, at risk, um, who is very low on, say, hippocampal volume, and we can get them increasing towards the, the, middle, the middle band, towards where most people are. Or we could take someone who's already there and try and maintain their brain health as indexed by keeping them going on this trajectory rather than falling off. Or we can get someone who's already high and make them even better towards peak or optimal performance. All of this is possible, but it's early days. One of our challenges, and it's a major challenge, is the fact that this is, is made very difficult by the fact that modern society and big industry and now pandemics and increasing chronic diseases that we're all faced with makes it very difficult to sustain, engage and sustain these behaviours. For example, there's a lot of industry like alcohol and gambling and food that constantly challenging our self-control by putting those sugary foods at low cost right in front of us within easy reach or gambling, advertising this to us, bombarding us with advertising that's precisely timed when we're most vulnerable with the precise type of triggers that make us really rev and uh, be vulnerable to re-engaging in gambling and so on. So we're constantly being challenged in this addictive environment or addictive environment or obesogenic environment, uh, alcohologenic environment, if that's possible. And as Australians, we love our gambling and alcohol and cannabis and so on. So it's a challenge. If we take that further, if we take person you know, in their daily routine when they wake up at several times throughout the day, we're challenged with lifestyle decisions or options, whether we wake up and we go for a run or we have a caffeine hit, whether we take a walk and have an apple or we sit down and have a donut hit with sugar or after work we have a, a chill and some reflection time and unwind or we get into the alcohol or at bedtime where we actually go to sleep or we grab the screen and start looking into various things that make us more worry or we put on a bet or we buy something and so on. So every day we make these decisions and a lot of us will move between the, the good and the bad side of these. But if we get stuck on this side, which is what a lot of these you know, influences can make us do, then a trajectory is not so good. And it, it's already obvious in young Australians where if you look at sub-threshold symptoms of gambling, so not disorder per se, but just problematic gambling, it's quite a big proportion of people there. And it's the same with substance use. It's the same with the amount of sugars and fats we eat. So we're making ourselves more and more vulnerable to mental ill health. And what we want to do is lean over to the other side and use the, the pro-health benefits of lifestyle medicine to be able to go down this path towards mental wellness. And that's, that's essentially the goal of Brain Park is to, to help us do that. And we ask three questions. Um, Try and understand how do these lifestyle and technology-based, uh, we include technology and lifestyle, how do they help improve these cognitive brain mental health um, outcomes? And how can we, in order to do that though, we have to be able to measure and monitor not only these, but also all of these 
in a much better way than we currently are. Without good measurement and monitoring, all we can do is we can say, my exercise makes me feel better. It gives me more clarity or energy or confidence or better thinking skills, but we don't actually have a, uh, a really good objective mechanistic understanding of what parts of exercise improve what specifically. Is it just a placebo feeling or is it real? And how do we take the actual features or the secret sources that are in exercise and apply it to the next person? In order to do that, we've got to have good rigorous measurement. I'm going to talk about those two now. So this is exactly what Brain Park is for. It's a basically, let's say it's a wellness center with exercise physiology, you know, an indoor and outdoor gym, exercise physiology room, uh, where we can take bloods and saliva samples. It's got everything that you would expect in a community gym, a spin room with interactive display, where you could be doing physical and cognitive challenges, a virtual reality room where we can put you in various scenarios that I'll be showing you. And we've got wearables on you and measuring all the signals that your body's giving off while you're engaged in these activities. So science is definitely there, but it's in the background. It's not in your face. It feels more like a communal center run by world experts in neuropsychology, neuroscience, exercise physiology, behavior change, technology, um, rather than a wellness center run by you know, health sort of wellness people or gym instructors, etc. It's It's a scientists running a wellness center with lots of science in the background. And all of this is sitting on one of the most advanced MRI neuroimaging centers in the world where we can look at the brain changes and the cognitive changes that are occurring as a result of engaging in sustained um, regular uh, modifications of your lifestyle. What are the changes that are, are a consequence? So we see this as it's a playground for the brain where we're constantly learning about how lifestyle medicine is actually working. And there is a number of reasons why we've chosen the kind of approaches that we have. First of all, we wanted to make sure that there's actually therapeutic potential in the things that we've chosen, like exercise, like mindfulness, and that they're empowering, that people can take them with, you know, with them where they go. It's not a specialized bit of equipment or something that costs an arm or a leg and it's not, it doesn't have side effects and so on. And even with something like uh, virtual reality, it's now quite affordable and mass produced for the community where more and more this technology will be just part of a typical entertainment system. And what we use is your standard commercial VR stuff. So uh, we can take whatever we learn in the, the lab at Brain Park out into the community because all the equipment is already out in the community. And hence the, the scalability we, we focus very much on things that are both good for your, your brain and your heart or your mind and your body. And very much the strength is measuring everything. So we understand all of those features or components of lifestyle medicine that really do work or don't work. So we can target, harness, personalize them. And that's the goal. So with that in mind, we've sort of focused on uh, mental and physical experiences that we give people at Brain Park through lifestyle and technology. So this is sort of our, our menu of options for our interventions. We also have brain stimulation that I haven't listed there, but it's less of a priority for us because it's less transportable and accessible to people. So this is the main menu. Um, and all of this is geared around the fact that it will change the brain if you engage in them regularly and intensively. So I've already illustrated, you know, in terms of our first question of understanding how does lifestyle and technology improve mental and brain health, I showed you that we try to break exercise down into its component parts. So not just say how does exercise affect um, your brain, but what features of exercise affect what outcomes. And the ultimate goal is someone might come in and say, look, I want to improve my cognition and my brain, that might be a different kind of exercise to, I just want a, a stress relief 
stress relief is probably more low to moderate intensity exercise. Whereas, um, as I showed you before, if you want cognitive and brain enhancement, particularly brain enhancement, we tend to work with much more higher intensity exercise, you know, trying to achieve above 80% of maximum heart rate level, staying in that zone for extended periods of time, three to four times a week over 12 weeks. And that's what gets you those brain changes, those positive brain changes. And the challenge then is to try to bottle that and understand it even further so that we can take those components and combine it with other things like maybe with diet and sleep uh, to power it up even more for better personal, uh, mental and cognitive and brain health. So as I said, we can then, just like we have with exercise, starting to break the parameters down and target them to different outcomes. We can do the same with mindfulness and yoga, with diet and with sleep so that we can eventually come up with these lifestyle packages that are really powered to, to enhance these outcomes. I want to now switch to measurement because it's such an important part of facilitating and fast-tracking the benefits of mental health, sorry, the benefits of lifestyle medicine for mental health and brain health. And at the moment, you know, the, a lot of areas of medicine, the cornerstone of science and medicine is to be able to measure things well and early so that you can detect problems and prevent them from happening or intervene early. Unfortunately, in mental health and mental fitness, our measures are not so great. We tend to ask people how they're feeling or we have experts. We don't always agree with other experts about um, trying to expertly define emotions and moods and mental health states. So. Either of them is not, not at the level of being able to use an objective index of how your mental fitness is going. To be able to detect things early, we don't have the tools. They're not accessible, affordable, available to us. So what tends to happen is uh, because we don't have those measures that we're aware of, things tend to look pretty calm on the surface. Meanwhile, what we, we don't really see any problems until these say, addiction and compulsive conditions become a real problem and come up to the surface, by which stage things are pretty severe usually. Uh, unfortunately, there was probably a, a good period of time before that where there was turbulence in the water, but we just didn't have the tools to be able to detect where, you know, what was about to surface or the fact that um, anything at all was about to surface. So. What we've done to try and overcome that is to consult or bring together a group of world experts, about 40 of them, and ask them, look, of all the things, the psychological drivers that might be in these turbulent waters that lead to, that drive and maintain these behaviours, what would you put your money on? What are some of them? Uh, and we started with about 50 concepts that could be candidates. And eventually over 12 months of consultation and iter iterative uh, academic arguments, we, we nailed seven constructs that we all, 80% of us agreed that were really important to be able to measure and modify if we were to change outcomes here. And these are the seven constructs. So now we understand the drivers of these behaviours. What we did is took those drivers and we uh, consulted with a game development company, Taurus, who typically just make games, as well as a bunch of community members who might have various addictions and compulsions. And we said to them, look, we want to develop games that will index this, like these profiles in people just by playing games. Help us make sure that one, they're really, you know, they're really engaging and they look great and they make people want to play them. And two, that they're actually meaningful, that they're not silly and they're irrelevant or academic but don't actually mean anything and through sort of a co-design process what we've done is develop these games that can be uh, done through a mobile phone or a tablet or a computer and on the front end you're playing this simple engaging game that has lots of things going on but at the back end there's a lot of sophisticated 
properties like the fact that even though it's a game, psychometrically these games are indexing these psychological profiles very reliably using uh, you know, various indices that we're using to check the psychometric properties of these tests. And also at the back end, we've got some very sophisticated analyses that is converging from these games at the back end that all the responses that we're giving is allowing us to index your how you're learning from reward, how quickly you're forming habits, whether you're finding it difficult to uh, control your inhibitions, uh, and so on. So at the front end, at the back end, there's all that sophistication going on. At the front end, we're giving people a very simple profile of their psychological uh, tendencies, uh, known as the R profile. We're still developing this, but essentially this is a summary of these seven that just um, simplifies it a bit more and gives the user a bit more information about what that means, those profiles. But from an academic standpoint and research, we know that these seven or four profiles can be driving a lot of addictive behavior, a lot of addictive behavior that could look very different on the surface, but underneath are driven by these uh, psychological tendencies. And similarly for uh, comorbid uh, mental health conditions as well. So we're running these interventions. Typically the people that have these profiles will enter into these interventions that we're running. And so as we do these interventions, we will also check to see how these psychological profiles are changing over time. And uh, not only do we look at things like the hippocampus and brain health and other areas of cognition, but we look to see if we're changing any of these by our interventions. If we are, then that's gold because it means we can then, uh, when people come to us with particular profiles, you know, they may have these problems and it's reward learning that's really driving a lot of these behaviours, then we can use our intervention, the one that works for reward learning, and tune that in. And so it gives us this transdiagnostic viable treatment target through lifestyle medicine. The other thing about decision making is that a lot of it tends to happen, particularly when we're talking about addictions and compulsions in dynamic contexts. So good and bad decisions and behaviors are made by an interaction of the agent, like let's say the electronic gaming machine, the environment, it could be other people or sounds, smells, and the person themselves. So the interaction there is what drives good and bad behavior. So in order to properly test, measure and monitor decision-making and cognition, ideally you wanna put people in a casino environment or in this case, in a environment that is contaminated for someone with OCD who is triggered by contamination. So we've developed a virtual casino and a kitchen and a bathroom that is very contaminated in order to really immerse people in these environments. And they really do get immersed and then create all the cravings and the fear and disgust of being in that environment, then get them to make decisions and measure things in that dynamic environment. And you can see here uh, the two conditions where someone's, you know, uh, putting raw meat in a fridge or in a bathroom or in a casino. We're, we've got them wired up into lots of, we're measuring lots of body signals from the heart, from respiration uh, and so on. And in this condition, you can see there's a, a disgust and a fear that really is, as people in this condition feel just as disgusted to pick up that bit of toilet paper from the ground as they do in real life. So we can, using virtual reality, put people in high risk situations, but safely, and then work in real time with their behaviors and decision making to, to try and drive therapeutic outcomes. And so we're pretty excited by some of these technologies. And this is the work of uh, these students, as well as a lot of this involves working with clinics like the Melbourne Clinic, where we've placed this environment, uh, but also working with end users and clinicians to make sure these environments really are effective and relevant. So coming back to the original question of, can we help this young man by offering these kind of 
lifestyle and technology-based solutions? I think we can, as I've shown you. We've already developed tools that are expert consensus. We have expert consensus on that we've worked years to develop that are psychometrically reliable, that index these core psychological constructs that drive a lot of addictive behavior. We can measure that now just by playing, getting this person to play games. And then we can put them in a 12 week intervention that will get this person's brain a bit more open to breaking old habits and learning new habits. Maybe it'll even switch certain genes on and other genes off for the better or promote certain neurochemicals that are more in tune with stress resilience. Uh, and we know there's evidence of all of that by physical exercise. And I showed you evidence of that from our, our student studies. And I also showed you how we can put a head mounted display on this young person, put them in a gambling environment and then really see what triggers their behaviors. What of these is really responding to the gambling environment to give us an insight into what we can work with and in real time that we would never be able to do in, a, in another way. We'd just have to be relying on the person's insights and memory and so on, which is too hard. And then something I didn't talk about is we could also give this person skills in mindfulness to be able to surf the gambling urges and cravings, which has been shown to be very effective in itself. So if we could combine all of these as a tool, an engaging, fun, effortful tool for this person to engage in, it might be another solution that they would actually engage in. And of course, the final challenge would be then how do we, what are some of the techniques to sustain this behavior in the long term? And we're working on those, and I haven't expanded on those today. But if we can do all of this, I suspect a lot of this will have long term and beneficial effects, not only for this person's gambling and finances more broadly, but their understanding of, they, how, of how they form habits which might spill over into the nature of the relationships they have or their work and school, but also help them overcome other mental health and physical health issues and maximize their brain health for longevity. And in doing all of this, what we're doing is providing people with a very engaging and empowering experience that's providing positive influences on their brain. We're focusing on underlying psychological drivers of behavior. And we're really looking to work with end users, clinicians to, uh, to sustain, implement and scale these behaviors so that the, the, the net benefits are much broader than just what we're focusing on here. I'd like to thank all of these. There's numerous students and people that, and organizations that are really involved in, uh, in all of this. Uh, I'd particularly like to thank my uh, Deputy, Dr. Rebecca Segrave, who's been really with me uh, a long part of this journey and has been instrumental uh, in this work. And I might just stop sharing my screen. So um, before I let you go, I've got uh, another 10 minutes and I guess I wanted to just broaden the discussion to some of the, um, some of the both more specific things that we're doing as well as the broader things that we're doing at the Turner Institute. So I'm just going to share my screen and take you through a couple more things. So if you remember, I <clears throat> mentioned that we did this Delphi study in the context of addiction where we surveyed 40 people and narrowed um, seven drivers of a range of addictive behaviors, substance and behavioral addictions. Uh, we narrowed it down to seven. So what we're doing at the moment, together with Eugene Aidman, who is one of the leaders in the cognitive fitness uh, area, who's really pioneering some of this work, but we're working together to try and come up with a transdisciplinary expert consensus on the neurocognitive drivers of performance under pressure. So what we're doing is another international Delphi study, this time of 80 world experts. And we're asking the question, what are the psychological constructs that underlie optimal performance in dynamic and high pressure environments? Now you can see that question can be applied to a range of areas, including first responders, sport and competition and the military and 
In fact, we've got experts from across all of those areas to address this question in order to uh, see if some of these constructs, just like here, they apply across different addictions. We want to know if there's psychological constructs that really drive peak performance, sustain peak performance across all of these disciplines. So it's a, it's a really interesting study that, um, that we have. And uh, Eugene is involved, but as is John, he's part of our advisory group on this study. And we've just started this about six months ago and we're sort of halfway through. And what we hope to do by the end of it is that the, the Delphi study would have given us uh, a bit of a roadmap because at the moment what we see in this area is experts from different areas are throwing around lots of terms that they think are critical for um, peak performance and unfortunately because there's no dictionary or common language or framework all of these different terms can mean different things to different people so you know, two people might be using the word situational awareness for very different reasons and defining it differently or working at very different levels of abstraction of uh, what are the cognitive or psychological drivers. Some could be referring to very specific things, others to very broad things. So what we need is a, a bit of a framework and a structure and a dictionary to bring all of this together and we have been able to do that. We've, we've got this uh, framework called the research domains criteria which provides about 40 constructs that are relatively well defined. They're based in our brain functions so they consolidate a lot of the learnings that we've developed over the past 20 years about brain circuits and, uh, and what brain functioning looks like and how it can be broken into its component parts. There's about 40 constructs and we're using that as a beginning, not an end, just a beginning. Um, and what we hope to do is by using those constructs and bringing all of these different terminologies into sort of the one textbook or the one language and getting these 70 experts across different disciplines to see if they can agree on which ones are really core for sustained peak performance. If we can get that, then we're providing a bit of a, a shared direction in where we should all go in order to really advance the, the field. So it might be that these uh, experts tell us that there are five constructs that irrespective of whether you're a first responder in sport and competition or military, that there are five constructs that are key to individual differences in peak sustained performance under dynamic high pressure environments. So once we get that, what we would be hoping to do is then not stop there because that's just still a concept. Uh, we need to then develop measures that will be actually be psychometrically valid and reliable and be able to predict sustained peak performance. And when we've got that, then we want to take it to actual end users across military, stakeholders across sport and competition and first responders and make sure that it makes sense to them that we're not developing these measures that are academically meaningful, but in the real life aren't really meaningful and therefore aren't going to be adhered to or completed. Uh, once we've got that, then we've got this really nice tool to be able to map individual differences in these constructs of high relevance to sustained peak performance. And once we've got that, we can actually map those individual differences where we can understand which constructs are actually trainable and which ones are more fixed and not trainable. We're just essentially born with it and there's not much room for change. And if there are some constructs where there are significant individual differences that can be trained, well, what are those training modules? Are they based in technology such as uh, brain training or brain stimulation or maybe virtual reality? Or are they based more in lifestyle mechanisms like the amount or type of sleep and exercise and diet you have or how much mindfulness you practice? Can those things change these constructs? And finally, we can then use them to 
monitor and so uh, really to monitor people's progress whether it's a, as a function of training but also they might be out in the field and we detect some changes in these constructs uh, which might be placing them at risk depending on the circumstances that they're in or we could use them these constructs to identify uh, you know high um, high yield candidates that might be very suitable for certain uh, job descriptions based on their assessments. And this all is a lot of work, um, but it's important work because if we can do it, then we start to really standardise the entire field, think some kind of gold standard coordinated activity to pull the work that's going on across all of these areas into a much more, um, you know, shared direction and maybe we can even generate pooled data and facilitate the, the, the entire field progressing much more rapidly than it is at the moment in a fragmented way with no standardized measurement tools, just concepts. And obviously we, as I've illustrated to you, we've done this before in the area of addiction and mental health where we've developed these games um, that do measure the constructs of interest that are fit for purpose, that map individual differences and, um, and that can actually be, some of them can be trained quite readily. So we, we're gonna get there, but it's gonna take a bit of time. And just to go from that very specific element to now finally just a few slides on the broader context within which I work, and that is I work within the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health, and I encourage you to visit our website, have a look at some of the work we're doing because we really are a, you know, quite a large organisation looking at um, brain and mental health that is of relevance to a lot of you guys and girls. And I think that there's a lot of room for collaboration and working together and doing projects jointly. So uh, just to tease you with a couple of other labs that are doing work at the Turner Institute. So one of them is the Movement and Exercise Neuroscience Lab of James Coxon. So he's very interested in uh, the role of exercise and how that can change the physiology of the brain and also influence learning and memory. So he runs experiments where he, uh, for example, in this study, he looked at three conditions where he, he placed uh, people either into a high high intensity interval training and moderate intensity continuous training or a rest condition. And in those three conditions after exercise, he applied this uh, theta burst stimulation using brain stimulation. And the idea here is that uh, this theta burst stimulation is supposed to enhance plasticity in the brain. And what James is interested in is understanding whether this theta burst stimulation of enhanced plasticity has a, a greater effect in those who either just rest prior to it, do moderate exercise or high intensity exercise. And what he found is that uh, after about 15 to 20 minutes of this, the, this theta burst stimulation, it's actually the high intensity exercise group that showed the greatest amount of plasticity after about 15 to 20 minutes uh, in the brain. And so that means that maybe this kind of exercise combined with this kind of brain stimulation can really enhance learning and memory consolidation and can be applied to either enhance these functions or normalize them in conditions where they're problematic. So it's very interesting. And uh, another lab, the Cognitive Neurology Lab of Dr. Trevor Chong, who's a neurologist. So he's very interested in the idea that there is both cognitive and physical motivation. So he looks at comparing sort of the, the cost benefit ratio that people go through in the computation of their own head about how much effort am I gonna to expend to gain this kind of the reward that's out there. And so he's looked at um, uh, Oxford uh, rowers, and what he found was that the amount of energy and effort these elite athletes are willing to expend physically in terms of getting the reward is actually not that different to people who are not 
athletes per se, but it's the amount of cognitive effort they are willing to go to to attain a reward that differentiates these Oxford athletes from non-athletes, which is interesting as well. So there's a bit of broader context for you all in terms of the Turner Institute. I hope you have a great conference and you enjoy the rest of the, the talks. And thank you to, to John and for Eugene for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mirat, thank you so much. My only comment would be that we would all undoubtedly love to hear more from you. Perhaps the college could bring you back for another CPD opportunity in the new year. I know that our chair, John Crampton, has some questions that have come from our members and a few of his own. So we might turn over to John so he can gain some further insights into your work. John, over to you. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, Mirat, that's been a wonderful presentation. And uh, yes, we do have a heap of questions. Um, hopefully we can get through most of them, but. Uh, can I uh, just pass that invitation on right now to, to continue this discussion uh, at some stage in the near future? Um, we're seeing a really rapid expansion and an acceptance in the use of wearables uh, pretty much across sport. Um, I suppose one of the concerns is uh, who actually should be using them? Not the athlete, but in fact the person that's actually driving the study. How, how much background, how much knowledge do you think people really need to have to get the most out of uh, the use of wearables? Not necessarily in a research environment too, just by the way, possibly even in an applications environment. Um, so I have a specific question for you, which is um, who would you let into your lab uh, to actually use your equipment? What kind of qualifications are you looking for for some of the operators uh, of your equipment? Some of the people that you're actually bringing into the research projects to drive them? No, look, it's a really good question when you, when you reverse it that way. We actually built the lab specifically to be external facing so that it's, it's sort of, uh, it's got a communal feel and a lot of the things that we have in there, including the equipment, whether that's the, you know, the spin bikes or the gym equipment or the virtual reality equipment, other technologies like tablets, everything we have in there is commercially available to the, the your general consumer. And we do that on purpose so that anything we find, we can then transport that into the real world. And, uh, it, you know, that translation from the lab to the real world, which is a major issue for a lot of us, one, due to time and two, due to, you know, the inability to transfer these equipment because either they cost too much and we can't scale it and so on. We didn't want any of that to be a barrier. So all of the things, equipment we have is generally speaking, commercially available, except for a few things. Um, you know, an MRI scanner is not just available to you and I, it's very specialized and it needs very, very delicate operation. Um, some of the things in our exercise physiology uh, room, which is, you know, the treadmill that has a million functions and requires very delicate operation to index someone's VO2 max or various other um, aspects. So the things where we're trying to understand the mechanisms of how these lifestyle behaviours or technologies are changing our brain, our thinking, our mental health, our cognition, the mechanistic part of things are things that we probably you need a high level of expertise and we wouldn't let people just jump on and use them we would train people to a certain level that we would be we're very happy with that it's safe they're not putting themselves or others at danger etc we have rigorous training protocols so we would go through all of that but a lot of our mechanistic equipment whether that's the scanners or the treadmill and so on we only need to do those studies once so let's say we're interested in what a particular form of exercise is doing on the brain or dopamine system in the brain, et cetera. We would do that once in a really well-designed study and we would understand its mechanisms. And then we would take that out into the community where we don't have to continually do that. We would roll that program out in gyms or in sporting um, clubs, et cetera, because we've now demonstrated very rigorously that it has certain brain, mental health, chemical effects, et cetera. So when it comes to the mechanics, we definitely would 
we have specialized equipment, but when it comes to actually doing the activity, whether that's on a treadmill, uh, sorry, whether that's on a bike or a spin bike or weights or VR equipment, et cetera, they're all out there. We can use all that equipment to get people engaged in the activities. We just can't understand the mechanisms, but that's what the lab's for. Thanks, Mirat. Um, we're getting a better understanding of, uh, of Brain Park. Um, one of my questions is, is there an intent for Brain Park to be a clinic or actually run as a clinic? You're sounding like it's a bit different to that. It was, you know, it was, it was actually, we started with a very strong sort of idea that, and, and in fact, we have clinic in the name. It's the David Winston Turner Research Clinic. So it started off as something that wanted to be very much about the translation of knowledge into, into practice and policy. And that's what we do. But we thought when we first started, and you know, Brain Park's only two years old, the research is a lot older than that, uh, but the actual building Brain Park is two years old. But when we started, we thought we'd head down where we would have a, um, you know, a traditional clinic where people could drop in and uh, we would do various treatments. But having gone through the past couple of years, we're now realising the huge potential of lifestyle behaviours and technology on not just the clinical part of things, but on the community more broadly, both in terms of, you know, increasing health, preventing illness, both physical and mental. And so we sort of really reflected to think where would we have our biggest impact, whether we would open a clinic and have a small number of people doing very intensive treatments, which kind of already exists, um, not necessarily the way we do it, but those services exist. Whereas the big missing part is the people who don't necessarily have a specific problem or even a problem, but they want to get healthier, better, or maybe they're you know wavering in and out of certain problems, but there's not a, um, a, a deep enough, strong enough, long enough problem. And those people are, you know, there's an optimal time there where they're willing to be helped. Um, and so we think we would have a much bigger impact with less intensive, but more reach in terms of our program. So we've shifted more to more we still work with clinics, but we put stuff into other people's clinics and we're more going down a community uh, pathway. And we've started reaching into, as you know, the more peak performance area as well, um, as well as into workplaces where they're becoming more and more interested in um, the general health and fitness, both physical and mental again, of their workforce, because uh, there's increasing evidence showing if people are feeling healthy and they're more productive, they're, they're less absent, and even if they're you know, uh, present, they're more effective while they're present as opposed to uh, being present but actually not being that effective and productive. So uh, there's, there's a lot more interest in the broader community and we're heading that way. Mirat, where do you think your students are going to finish up? Um, it sounds like there's quite a few... Uh, different backgrounds of some of the people that are working with you. Um, are there some interesting opportunities coming up for, uh, for students? I love the fact that in some ways we don't know where our students are going to end up. And that's one of the strengths and exciting parts of in my role where I see a student come in starting you know, over there and they end up somewhere totally different um, because Brain Park has sort of built this uh, capability where we have neuroscientists, we have psychiatrists, we have psychologists, sort of a traditional blend of people. But now we've got people who design games and tech, you know, tech technology who are coming into the lab, spending a day or two, two there, people who are uh, physics background or exercise physiologists or physiotherapists or you know we're taking on more and more disciplines and talking in a much richer language and so that provides these students with the opportunity to start somewhere but then find the things that really spark them and navigate through that maze and end up within the same lab in a totally different area. And we've had that happen time and time again, where 
people come and say, look, I'm really interested in research, but they end up being the, um, the uh, operations manager of Brain Park because they become more interested in the business side of things, or they become more technical implementation people, or, um, or they continue with research. It doesn't matter that there's a lot of options. And I think going forward, it seems to me that having experiences in a bit more diverse areas and being able to bridge disciplines really well is gonna hold a lot of sway in terms of employability as opposed to drilling deeper and deeper and deeper into a very specialized area. And so I think we, we will be, um, providing those kind of students that have quite a, a breadth to their um, experiences. So I suppose kind of linked question, um, is there a pathway where people, students, actually find a way to, to get to Brain Park to, to start working with you? Because we have a large lab, a lot of us do presentations like the one today and then word of mouth gets out and people inquire from all over, all over the world. And um, we do have, uh, you know, the university does a lot of advertising as well. And, and our school of psychology, um, you know, psychology has a lot of students, obviously, and they, when you're at a research intensive university like Monash University, you've sort of got this consistent knocking of the door of students interested in various topics. So um, we're certainly fortunate to have really good students and a consistent supply of them. What's your view of the growth of wearables in sport? I mean, obviously you wouldn't see a Richmond player training without the heart rate meter, GPS you know, kit. Um, uh, where do you see the wearable trend going? I'm a big fan, I love it just, um, First of all, in terms of, uh, I went to the CES conference a couple of years ago in, in the States, which is the, the, I forget what it stands for, but it's all about technology, consumer technology and development. So Google do a lot of their presentations and Apple and so on. And I went to a few of the sessions where some of the latest wearables were, they were talking about it. And there's just so much development in terms of this, um, you know, the fabric that we're wearing as uniforms is going to contain more and more sensors detecting everything from, you know, heat to sweat to the amount of UV exposure to lots of other things that are going on. And I think it's going to be a massive area of data collection coming up. And for me, working in an area where I'm shifting my focus from disorder specific investigation. So I used to look at, you know, what are the mechanisms of schizophrenia or alcohol abuse or um, gambling? What changes do they cause in thinking and the brain, those disorders to now I've moved into a space where I go, what does physical activity and the different parameters of physical activity do to the brain? What does, you know, mindfulness do? What does diet do? What does sleep do? And breaking that all up I've moved away from disorder specific to looking at these behavior specific things. And the problem we face is that we all know good, healthy habits, they make us feel good. They make us confident, they make us energetic, they make us you know, think better or deal with stress better. We feel this and know this, but we can't quantify it. And um, we can't quantify it because we don't have really good measures uh, to, to look at these associations. And, and I think that these wearables are now really providing the opportunity to not rely on people's feelings or memories of exercise or sleep, but to actually properly quantify the parameters. And that then provides a, you know, we're great at analyzing data, we love data. And we can look at then lots of associations, whether that's, um, you know, the type of exercise that you're doing in we can look at for example the contagion effect of healthy lifestyle behaviors when you exercise how does that influence your sleep how does sleep then influence your diet and all of those things together how do they influence your cognition and your mental health and we can do all of that with passive sensing of quantification of all of those lifestyle behaviors together with you know 
tablet-based or uh, phone-based assessments of your cognition. And so it provides this really ability to measure and monitor lifestyle in relation to cognition, mental health and brain health in a way that's much more real and out there and rich. Um, and once we can do that, we can then also look at not only the individual, which is, you know, we're giving off signals all the time, we're capturing that at the micro level, we can look at those micro influences in relation to macro influences in the environment, whether that's policy or, you know, uh, uh, other kind of, you know, it could be the pollution in the air or it could be other macro factors and how do all of those things come together at micro and macro levels to influence our health. And there's some really interesting work now that's, that's looking at some of this and finding things like climate change, obesity and under nutrition are all related to the same thing. And they're close at the micro level of the person because, um, which is interesting that you could influence those three really big things out there at a personal micro level. And um, it just opens up a whole new way of looking at research. One of the issues about wearables is actually trusting the data. Uh, most developers not only want to own the product, but they also want to own the data by putting it you know, on a dashboard up in the cloud with tight control on their IP, their, their algorithms, so on and so forth. Um, what's your position on, on the kind of data we're getting from the current collection of wearables? You know, there's a lot of apps out there when you look at it, something to do with uh, whether it's apps or technologies that are around lifestyle behaviors that are supposed to improve your cognition or your mental health or your brain health. And there's been very good systematic reviews of the technologies and the apps that are out there. And often 99% of things out there don't actually transfer as being efficacious for cognitive health, uh, mental or brain health. So we're only left with the sort of 1% of, at best, of the 100% of things out there. Um, so in terms of actually being clinically therapeutic and meaningful, there's not that much out there, even though we know and we think there's a lot out there. For us, um, it's about the rigor of testing a lot of the, the equipment. So for example, uh, we're developing an assessment of, you know, I, as I talked about the assessment of cognition, the, the Brain Pack app, we've been developing that for five years now. And there's a lot of work that goes into um, validating it from a psychometric sense of making sure that when we're making it more complicated, the game, and it's got lots of sounds and things going on, that we're not losing the resolution of the experimental parameters, that it's actually testing this very specific cognitive process that we're interested in. And we have to do reliability, validity, cons you know, construct validity, discriminant validity, all these psychological statistical approaches that we know about. We, we test those in the background before and we continually test them and optimize them. And once we do that, we would then take them to both the industry to say, how can we make this more engaging while keeping these experimental parameters? But at the same time, we would take it to end users or people with lived experience, depending on where we want to apply these tools and say, hey, does this make sense to you? Would you use it or would you just stop using it and throw it away after a couple of sessions? Does it, is it too childish for you? Is it too, you know, ask a lot of questions and make sure it's meaningful. And then similarly, at the, in terms of the feedback that we would give as well, based on those tools, um, we have a lot of ideas from an academic sense that sound is really interesting to us, but they're not interesting at all to the, to the end user. And we want to integrate those things in there as well. And what I like about a lot of um, apps and wearables at the moment is, you know, they make the display very user friendly. They're, they're very engaging, simple, meaningful, even, they may not be reliable and valid, but the presentation is very good. And we can learn a lot about that in terms of what we can do. And we tend to way overcomplicate things and present way too much information. And 
So if I can push further on that, as the guy that's actually doing the data collection, um, you know, putting the numbers together in your various studies, um, what would you do before actually adopting a particular wearable, the, accepting the data from a particular wearable? If the app or wearable is not fully developed and there's some question about its reliability, um, are you prepared to accept some kind of like percentage value of the information coming out of it? Say if there's a trend in the data um, that looks like it's showing us something of relevance, um, can we rely on that given all the vagaries of collecting that data, not only with a perhaps untested uh, device, but also in an uncontrolled applications environment? It's a difficult one. I mean, you, I think you have to be specific. You have to apply that to a very specific area to know whether you would have confidence or not. There's been plenty of times in my work where I've sort of, there's been trend level things happening but I haven't believed it's going to go in. It's too noisy. It's just not going to end up where we want it to. And similarly with, you know, our, our um, cognitive assessment tool, there's been times where I've thought, this is just trend level things, but it's not actually going to be meaningful and get us to the point of consistently at an individual level telling us something that's informative. And, and so that, that's why we've kept going back to the drawing board and going, it's not ready. It's we're not, we don't believe it ourselves yet. So we need to keep going and pushing different aspects of the product in order to then get to a point of saying, okay, it's not perfect, but now we believe that it's actually got some meaningful, um, uh, you know, utility in it. And we're certainly there now, but even within some of our best products, there's been lots of times where I've doubted that we're there yet um, and it takes it's taken us you know five years and maybe over half a million dollars to to get to a point where we feel more confident um, and it's tempting because when you're in research and funding is limited and you want to you want to show impact you don't always have the time or the luxury to spend five years and half a million dollars to get to that point. Your your next fellowship is up or your position is up that you have to show impact. So you're almost forced to believe in it before you actually believe in it because the time scale of research works on one to three years. And, um, and often if you wanna do rigorous, good quality studies, it's much longer than that, even for a relatively simple product. As a linked question, um, have you actually looked at developing your own wearables so that you can better trust the data that's actually coming from the equipment? I think we know that the, the public are really hungry for these lifestyle related behaviors and help and they, they know, they go to their GP and we know about people with say mental health issues, they don't have to be severe problems, but just people who need mental health, experiencing mental health difficulties who might go to their GP and about 80% of them are open to help with lifestyle change modifications, whether that's exercise or other forms of lifestyle change. But only about 3% of them get help because the GPs are too busy, there isn't enough support, there's not enough knowledge that they're not trained to necessarily be able to offer those services the allied health are there but you know the navigation of the whole health system is difficult to get to experts with um, good quality knowledge so what they end up doing is looking online for various help tools that can help them and they they end up with one of these 99 percent chance of something that sounds good, whether it's neurofeedback or an app or some technology that's going to change your uh, behavior and it's apparently evidence-based. And they, you know, they're vulnerable and they end up with the spending money on these things that actually have not a lot of efficacy. Professor Zachowski had already indicated in his um, keynote address that he wasn't quite sure that particularly the neuro-related uh, devices were quite there yet. Um, I'm wondering whether you've come across any research direction which was utilizing some kind of tech that you thought was going to finish like over here. And maybe that was what the manufacturer's claim was going to be for that particular equipment. 
but it actually ended up having some relevance or providing some insights about another concept over here altogether. I know Kenneth Graham's going to talk about this quite a bit. And so I agree with Leonard in terms of, you know, we're definitely not there yet. The, the excitement potential is there, but the rigor and the quality is not there to, to really be able to help yet. I think the first part is to measure things well. As, as sort of I've been alluding to, all, all these senses and measure and understand is always the first part. And once we do that well, then we shift into the, okay, how do we now intervene and change and modify things? And, you know, we're probably a little way off that. We're at the measurement stage and getting good quality measurement. In terms of changing direction, um, I've constantly changed direction myself uh, in terms of my research um, and looking for, you know, what into, you, you jump on one lily pad and you look around and, and you sort of see what the next most exciting lily pad for you is. And I've made quite a lot of those jumps. I've started from looking at very precise areas of, uh, visual attention and then totally jumped into brain science and then jumped over there into schizophrenia and then addiction and now moving into more lifestyle medicine type approaches and along that path in terms of technology um, <clears throat> I, I think we we sort of if I you know I'm, I'm talking about the brain pack tool a lot uh, we started with that being maybe a tool for assessing cognition. But as we've gone along with and we've consulted with consumers and end users and people with lived experience, we found that, you know, for some people, our definitions of cognition and outcomes are very interesting. And for others, it's just not at all. And they would prefer to know about, um, you know, things to do with, uh, identity and hope and uh, broader aspects of you know, existential experience. And they wanna know how those things are changing, not necessarily cognition. And so we've ended up building some of those things into these apps based on the feedback that we're getting about what is important to them. Uh, and that way we can get not only say cognition, the, the outcomes that we're interested in, but also give people the outcomes they're interested in. And maybe the two are related, we don't know, but we're getting both and um, in a sort of efficient way, trying to cover both, you know, what our needs and their needs. And so we keep evolving that technology based on ours and end user and industry needs. And so I'm not sure if that's a good answer or not, but staying open to, to feedback and adapting, I think generally is a good thing. Mirat, has, has your lab been uh, able to inform the work going on in sport in relation to concussion management? This is a big area for us and not just uh, from the perspective of the mechanics of the concussion, but more importantly, the, the management of the time following. I mean, our, 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 our institute, actually, we have, you know, Jenny Ponsford and a number of others who have done a lot of work in the concussion area. Um, specifically, we haven't. We've actually, interestingly, uh, as I was alluding to before, we, we built Brain Park with a view that others would come and use it as well uh, in order to maximise the role of lifestyle and technology in health. And we've recently had an industry uh, group come in who want to use Brain Park using virtual reality to detect concussion. Um, they, they have a, a commercial product that they think is very sensitive to be able to detect concussion and they want to use the Brain Park environment and benefit from some of the sort of uh, scientific uh, rigor that we have there to test and develop their product. So that's sort of a side thing. Um, you've been driving the Delphi CF2 project now as well, clearly. So what else do you see that your lab will be doing in sport? In terms of Brain Park's role in sport, I think bringing rigor is something that we, we are good at and we have really, really good um, research design people, uh, analytical people. And 
you know, if we look at the, the, the Delphi study, for example, I talked about how we're trying to bring a bit of a dictionary framework that unifies us to talk together in the same language about concepts that we're all throwing around. And that's the first step to getting good measurement. And once we get good measurement, we can apply good design to ask really good questions and then change, um, modify things much more effectively once we understand, once we get those good measurements in place. Um, and so I think we can influence the field by bringing that scientific rigor to the concepts that we're talking about. And we also, I think we can, we, we work, we've had a lot of discussions with various sporting groups. Um, one of them is uh, gamers. So people who for a living, develop, you know, play games eight hours of the day, that's their job and they compete and they have leagues. And, um, and one of the interesting things there is where is the boundary between gaming and addiction? And it's really difficult, actually, particularly when gaming is your job. And um, so there are various competition groups who are, who are gamers where um, this boundary, it's really important to manage it, both in terms of player health, their performance. Um, and so there's opportunity there for us to work with these kind of sporting groups where we can, using our measurements and experience and uh, research studies be able to help them navigate where things are heading down a more problematic path and make sure that the you know the more well-being part is staying in, in check and that their performance is coming from a um, you know a good place as opposed to from an addiction standpoint and um, because a lot of these people, you know, their careers might be short. And at the end of that, we wouldn't want that to be a problem. And uh, we'd want them to be able to walk away from a, just like any other sporting, you know, having had some fun, but not addicted to something that's going to cause a lot of problems down the line. You're right. There's some very interesting parallels from that comment uh, between addictive behavior and the extremely unusual lifestyle of elite athletes. Uh, perhaps we can spend some more time discussing that soon. Mirat, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a wonderful presentation with great insights. Um, back to you, Eugene. Mirat, on behalf of our COSEP members and the National Committee, can I thank you once again for joining us at the 2020 annual conference. I'm sure that you will have more than grabbed the attention of both our long-term practitioners and the APS fellows, and most likely all of our student members. You may well get a number of inquiries from them. Could I suggest that any conference attendees reaching out to Murat identify yourselves as a COSEP member to assist Murat in responding to your inquiries? This completes our three keynote presentations for the 2020 COSEP National Conference. You might be interested to know that a member of Murat's research team, Rebecca Kirken, will be adding a presentation detailing the current Delphi study on the cognitive fitness framework as our next speaker in the conference. For those not familiar with the Delphi research protocol, you will find her presentation highly informative. Three, two, one. As a further teaser, I know I'm personally looking forward to other presentations, including the one from Dr. Kenneth Graham on the use of technology to answer questions about athlete performance, and a joint presentation about rally driving, diving, and preparing a national championship winning football team. Stick around. This conference gets better every step of the way.